talk about, and we're doing this Winning in Life series, we're going to talk about a guy named Gideon. And as we've been going through this series, we're talking about, you know, listen, this life is not all that matters. What really matters is the next life. But in this life, we can get focused on the wrong things. We can become afraid, and we can worry about things that don't matter. And in each of these stories, we've been looking at Old Testament characters especially that, um, where God used them, and they overcame certain things. And the hope is that maybe in your life, you relate to some of these things, even stories from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago that you even say, you know, I struggle with that. This guy Gideon was born with the name Gideon. The word Gideon means destroyer. Now, that could be awesome, okay, uh, uh, if you're like Conan, the destroyer, you know, that's like, I'm awesome. Or the destroyer could be what you say to your children when you walk into their rooms, right? Uh, are you the destroyer? Uh, by the way, one of the ways, if you want to, because the word Gideon means destroyer, so all you have to do is, when you walk into your kid's room, you go, wow, just like Gideon. And um, you call him the destroyer. So he had two names. One was destroyer. That wasn't necessarily a positive thing. It could mean something awesome, but it basically meant somebody who breaks stuff. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be known as Eric who breaks stuff. That's just not the name I want. The other name he got, he got in a very interesting way. He, uh, and, this, and they actually refer to it several times in Scripture, is called Jerubbabel. And what that, and that's fun to say, by the way, Jerubbabel. Um, but what that basically means is he went and he tore down the Baal altar. And it was funny because God told him to do it. So he said, sure. And it was his own family. God told him to do it. And he said, uh, he said okay, I'll do it. And so he goes in the middle of the night because he's scared and does it. Of course, they know it's him. And they want to kill him. And his uncle basically says, no, 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 let, if Baal's real, let him fend for him. And so they named him Jerubbabel, meaning the one Baal's going to get. And so he had two names. One was Destroyer, and the other one is Guy Baal's going to get. I don't know about you, but I don't really like either of those names. Anybody? I would like to name my child Destroyer. Anybody in here, that's your, that's your goal? I'd like to name my child the one that Baal is going to get. I don't, I don't think either of those would. And so, so Gideon already had this on him. Some of us believe what other people said about us. Some of you grew up in a home where you had a parent who called you stupid all the time. Now, I don't like to use that word, but some of you had a parent that called you that. Some of you had a parent who said you always break everything, and so you've gone around in life saying, I always break everything. Maybe you had a coach or somebody else who made you feel like you couldn't do anything, that you were incompetent, that you were a failure, and you constantly go around and that's your name. I want you to know today it's not about the name that anyone gives you. It's about the name that God gives you. And as we look at Gideon today, you need to understand that Gideon, just like you and I, Gideon was weak. Gideon was broken. Gideon was scared. Gideon lacked faith so often. And Gideon felt like a failure to start with. And we're going to pick up the story there. We're going to look at three things. And here it is. This sermon is titled, Overcoming Your Strengths. Because we get in two extremes. We get in the one extreme of thinking we're a little better than everybody else. Or we get in the other extreme of going, God can't use me. Everybody else is more talented than I am. Neither one of those is right. All that matters is what God says about you. So here's three things to help you to overcome your strengths. Number one, admit your weakness. We pick up the story in Judges chapter 6. Uh, let me give you a little background. The Midianites and, and other groups, it wasn't just the Midianites, would cross the Jordan, basically come and destroy all the Israelites' crops and uh, uh, kill them and, and steal from them and everything. So the Israelites had no food, so they started planting food kind of secretly in different places in the heel, hills, or the hills, uh, the hills, if you're from Tennessee. And uh, uh, what happened is Gideon then uh, is, is getting the grain, and he's basically hiding under a tree next to a wine press, and he's, you know, uh, taking care of the grain. And here's what happens in verse 12. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, listen to this, mighty warrior. Now, Gideon, at this point, does the Three Stooges act. I don't know if you remember, the Three Stooges, and this they did this over and over. They would walk into a room, all three of them, right? Hey, Mo, hey, Larry, hey, Carly, come here. 
And they'd walk into a room, and the guy would say, gentlemen, and what would they do every time? Where? Right? They were wondering where the gentlemen were. When the angel says, mighty warrior, to Gideon, I think Gideon did the, is there somebody else here? Here's what he says. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? You ever feel that way? God's really in my life. Why, why does difficulty happen? Why do trials happen? Why does trouble happen? Where are all his wonders our ancestors told us about when they said, did the, not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? So basically he's beginning to question God. Is God even real? And then he says, but now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. Now I love the answer that is given here. Go in strength. <laughs> Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Now, by the way, scholars talk about this angel actually being Jesus. And the reason they think that, to make the theology just to shorten it for you, the reason they think that is because Gideon basically offers a sacrifice to the angel. Every other angel in the Bible rejects any form of worship. And what this one does is he accepts the offering. So the Lord turned to him and said, go in strength I have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? And then Gideon looks at him again. Um, pardon me. I love that. Pardon me, my Lord. But how, Gideon said, but how can I save Israel? And I love this. He starts making excuses. But he doesn't just make excuses for himself. He makes excuses for his whole family. My clan is the weakest in Manasseh. And I am the least in my family. Listen to what he says. So he says, he says, okay, do you realize who you're talking to? I'm from the idiot family. And I'm the biggest idiot in this idiot family. And you're coming to me? Are you crazy? I mean, he's just this kind of, he's like, who are you? You know, gentlemen, where? Right? And here's what the Lord answered. The Lord answered. You ready? You ready? I will be with you. And you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Can I tell you something about you? When you say, God, I don't think you can use me. If you're here today and you're a Christian, I want you to know that God can use you to be a blessing to others. God can use you to change people's lives. God can even use you to help people come home to Christ. And if you're not a Christian today, I want you to listen to the story of Gideon and realize that God has not given up on you. And that God wants you to come home. If you're here today, I want you to know it's okay if you don't understand the Bible. There might be times that you go, you know, Eric, I, I would help somebody, but I, you know, I don't really understand the entire Bible. Can I tell you something? I have a doctorate in theology. I don't understand half the Bible. There's times I look at it and I'm like, I don't, what, what do I do with this? What happened here? I don't always understand everything. And you know what? God can still use you. You ever feel like a failure? Gideon felt like a failure. Not only did he feel like a failure, he said that his family was a failure. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> hey, uh, God, not only am I, not only am I a loser, but my family's a bunch of losers. I mean, that's really what he says here. God's not worried about what you think about you. Did you hear me? God wants to tell you what he thinks about you. Do you struggle with trusting God? Gideon struggled with trusting God. Gideon even struggled with believing God was even going to help him. And yet God said, guess what? I'm going to be with you. He was just being honest. He was being honest about who he was and where he was at. He wasn't trying to, to I don't think he was trying to you know, yell at the angel. Or get, he was just being honest. Hey, this is who I am. This is where I'm at. And here's what I want you to know. We're all weak. We're all broken. And we need to admit, hey, I don't have it all together. If you, if you want to chase people away from God, pretend that you have everything together. But if you want people to get around you and go, you know what, their Christianity is real, then let me challenge you to do something. Be real. Now, by being real, I'm not saying go out and act like the world. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, be in the world, don't be of the world. 
So don't say, well, I, I'm not going to work on any of my bad habits because I just want to be whatever. But understand that God wants to work in you. Listen to what Matthew West's song says. I think it's a perfect description. If you've never heard this song, it says, it talks first about, hello, my name is regret. And then he says, hello, my name is defeat. And then he says this, hello, my name is child of the one true king. I've been saved. I've been changed. I've been set free. Amazing grace is the song I sing. What's your name? Your name's child of the king. God has a purpose and a plan for you, and even in your weakness, he is strong. Philippians 4.13 says it this way. I can do some things. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And you know what Paul is talking about in this passage? Paul is talking about all the hardships he's been through and keeping his eyes on God. No matter what you're going through, no matter what the difficulty is that you're having right now, no matter how you feel about you, no matter how you feel about your family. God wants you to know that even in your weakness through his spirit, he will make you strong. Do you believe that you have to strengthen yourself? Or do you believe that it's God that will give you strength? You know, as Americans, we have to be careful because we have this pull yourself up by your bootstraps mentality that we think, I just need to get over this. I just need to fix this. I just need to do this. But sometimes that's actually counter to what God wants to do. Sometimes God wants you and I to realize that we are broken and we are messed up. And in our own strength, we can't do anything. And if we even become religious and start reading our Bible, we begin to become prideful and brag about it to other people. We, we, we can become arrogant even in our religious activities if we're not sensitive to God's spirit. Johnny Erickson Todd, who's a paraplegic because of a diving accident as a teenager, said this. Deny your weakness and you will never realize God's strength in you. It's okay to be weak. It's okay to be broken. It's okay to say, without God, I'm nothing. But with him, I have strength. With him, I have power. With him, I have the ability to accomplish exactly what he wants me to in my life. Number two, God wants obedience, not ability. There's a story about a 10-year-old boy who wanted to take judo. The only problem was that he did not have a left arm. This story actually, I was reading about it this morning, it's actually been repeated. A lot of uh, senseis tell their students this story, so I think it's really cool. He was 10 years old, and, and his parents said, well, I guess you can. So they took him to a sensei, and he said, I will train you. You can do judo. I'll train you. So he began teaching him one move. Day after day, month after month, he would teach him this one move. And the student finally said, I want to learn another move. He said, no, 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 you're ready to go and be tested. So he took him to a competition. He put him next to another 10-year-old kid, and they took each other on. And guess what? The kid with one arm won. The story goes then he fought in several more and then he finally went to the championship. He said to his sensei, I, I don't know that I can do this. He goes, just trust me, just do the one move that you learn. And so he gets pinned a little bit and actually the, the referee was talking about maybe calling off the match and the sensei said, let it continue. And sure enough, that kid with only one arm was able to take his right arm and pin that guy. So he went to his sensei later and said, you know, you only taught me one move. How was I able to win? And he said, because the only defense in that move is for them to grab your left arm. Now, I want you to know in your life that very thing that you think is your biggest weakness. Maybe you're a bad listener. What? <laughs> Maybe you're an interrupter. Maybe you struggle with an maybe you struggle with an addiction to food to something else. Maybe you struggle with blurting out in church. It could be any of those things. <laughs> Listen to what it says in Judges chapter 7 when it talks about Gideon. The Lord said to Gideon, I love this. Okay, so oh, let me set the scene for you here. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. Here's what happened. Gideon apparently is a great leader, even though he's been hiding under a tree. Uh, uh, he goes out and basically recruits over 30,000 people. 
that's pretty much Port St. John. Like everybody comes out and says, yes, we're going to fight with you. So he gets them all together and God says, eh, it's too many. What? How do you have too many men to fight? That's like having too much money. You know, it's like, how much money is enough? A little bit more, right? That's what all the rich people used to say. And here's what he says. He says, you have too many men. And then he says, I cannot deliver Midian into their hands or Israel would boast against me that my own strength has saved me. Now announce to the army, I love this, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left. Imagine, okay, you're getting ready to go into battle. You line everybody up and they say to everybody, okay, are you scared at all? I'm scared. Okay, go on. Two out of three left right away. Two out of three went, yeah, I'm scared. I'm going home. And they went home. 22,000 people went home. He still has a lot of people, but 22,000, two out of three. So can you imagine how full it was? And then all of a sudden, like, you're still here? Yeah, I'm still here. You scared? No, I'm not scared. I guess not, because everybody was scared left. But it doesn't stop there. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Now, if you're Gideon at this point, you're like, what? What? What's your strategy? I mean, I remember hearing about this marching around the walls of Jericho thing, which seemed a little odd. But this even, but at least there were people there. What, what's the deal? So here's what he says. Take them down to the water, and I'll thin them out for you. I love that. <laughs> I wonder if he thought, you're going to kill some? You know, I don't know what he thought, right? If I say this one will go with you, he'll go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. Now, in seminary class, they love to argue about why the way they drank water was important. And if they cup the water, and we were talking about that this morning, then you could look up and see the enemy, or you could do that. You know why God did that? It, it, what they did after this, they go down to the water. Anybody who, like, put their face in the water or drank any way other than cupping their hands was gone. So he's only got 300 left now. 300? 30,000? 300? And God's like, well, that works. What? People argue about why they did that. Listen, God just wanted to know, do you trust me? Let me ask you this question. Do you trust God today? Do you trust that God has given you a name? Do you trust that God has given you a purpose? Do you trust that God has given you a reason for being alive today? Now, I want to take a time out for just a second. Uh, we, we need to do this. Okay, would you do me a favor? Just take a breath in and then breathe out. Okay, if you were able to do that, then God still has a purpose for you here on earth. If you weren't able to do that, please raise your hand and we'll have a nurse visit you immediately. All right? If you're still breathing, God has a purpose for you. God has a plan for you. He can use you to change someone else's life, even help someone come home to him. In Joel chapter 3, it says, let the weak say, I am strong. Do you ever feel weak? You say, God, in your strength and in your spirit, I'm strong. It's not your flesh. It's not because you're smart enough. You know, sometimes we think, well, I know the Bible or I'm smart enough. Or I'm... God doesn't use you because of what you know. Do you know how much our knowledge is compared to God's? God doesn't use you because you're strong. Ask Abraham. God had to, had to mess up his hip before he could use him. I mean, Abraham was so strong, he was able to pick up a rock that usually took two people to pick up. That's how the story starts. And God said, I've got to show you you're weak first. Do you feel weak? Well, maybe you're getting to the point that you realize God wants to use you. Are you going to obey him? Are you going to listen to him? After our service last night, one of the ladies came up to me and said, You know what, Eric? I've been praying about doing a small group. And after you talk tonight, I know that's what I'm supposed to do. I know God's been convicting me and telling me to do that. I'm going to do it. I'm scared. I'm going to do it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul had a lot of reason to boast. Paul was tutored by a dude that if you... A dude. Dude, he was tutored by a dude. Um, he was tutored by a guy who is still famous to this day. If you go to a rabbi and you ask him about this guy named Gamaliel, he'll say, yeah, Gamaliel was known for the, for the oral traditions. He, he was known as the end of the oral tradition. Well, that was Paul's teacher. It would be like if you were a math teacher and you said, yeah, I was trained by this guy Einstein. What? Yeah, like this. 
Me and Stein, I just call him Stein, right? Or I, I don't know what you call him. Paul had reason to brag, but listen to what he said. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships. By the way, do you delight in your weakness? Oh, I am so glad that I have a hard time paying attention. It's awesome. Oh, I am so glad that I get irritated in traffic. It's just the best. I'm so glad that I struggle with anger. It's just wonderful. I'm so glad I struggle with this habit. I, it's just a, Paul said, I delight in weakness. And then he says, I delight in insults. I don't know about you, but I don't delight in insults. When somebody comes to me and goes, Eric, you're a doofus. I don't go, oh, that is delightful. <laughs> Paul says, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships. Does life ever get hard? Paul said, I delight in these things. And then he says, in persecution, in difficulties. Well, Paul, are you crazy or what? Paul said, no, no. for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Because Paul realized that no matter how much he knew, how smart he was, even though he's a Roman citizen and had the world by the tail, that none of that mattered. It mattered that God had put his spirit in him. That God was the one that took care of him. That it was by, not by his works that he could be saved. By the way, the difference between Christianity and every other religion is very simple. Every other religion says do, do, and do. And then God will love you. Christianity said God loved you so much that he sent Jesus to die for you. It's done. You just need to accept his free gift of salvation. Say, Jesus, I receive your free gift of salvation and I surrender my life to you. And it's done. It's not about doing. It's about what he already did. So as much as Paul did, he said, when I'm weak, I'm strong. He said, I don't have it all together. Do you ever think about your... I want you to take a moment. Just think about one of your weaknesses. This should be exciting. You're going to feel really good after this one. Think about your weakness. What's one of your weaknesses? And then say, God, even in that weakness, I'm strong in you. Thank you for your strength. Finally, number three. Oh, wait. Here's a quote first. K. Arthur said, So many times we say we can't serve God because we aren't whatever is needed. We're not talented enough or smart enough or whatever. But if you're in covenant with Jesus Christ, He is responsible for covering your weaknesses, for being your strength. He will give you His abilities for your disabilities. Before we go to the last point, I want to introduce you to somebody. Darren Sproles is one of my favorite NFL players. It's all right. We need, to put a, we need to put a blank slide in between. So that, uh, Brent, uh, Bear, Darren Stoltz, who you're going to meet in just a second, is one of my favorite, favorite NFL players. And the reason why is because I'm taller than he is. If Darren Sproles showed up in church today and stood next to me, I'd be like, hey, man, how's it going? He's about a half inch shorter than me. But anyway, so, so I can only look down a little. Anyway, but, but he's an awesome running back. He is the first player in NFL history with over 2,200 all-purpose yards in four different seasons. Even though the dude's only 5'6", he never gave up, but that's not his biggest strength. But I want, you to, I want to introduce him to you before I tell you what his biggest strength is. which is awesome. And he's only 5'6", but can I tell you that's not his biggest strength? In February of this year, he admitted publicly, finally, it used to be they would do interviews with him and he would give one-word answers. He would just say, yeah, yeah, and give one word, and they never could figure out why. February of this year, he publicly admitted that he has struggled with stuttering since he was six years old. But here's why he's a hero in this respect. Because the reason he admitted it is because he found out about a young lady in school that was being bullied because she stuttered. And he went and met with her and struggled about how he was bullied when he was young. And to help her, he admitted his weakness 
in order to help her? Can I tell you that your weakness, that God always, you look all through scripture, God uses the weak. When you look at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all a bunch of liars, God used them. He used Moses, he used Peter, he uses broken, messed up, hurting people, and he always uses the weak so they can't claim that it's about them. So God says, I got, I got a strategy for you. Here's what I want you to do. You're down to 300 men. We're going to give you your supplies, guys. I want everybody to gather around. Okay, you get a water pitcher, you get a torch, and you get a trumpet. Uh, what? It, it would be like giving a football team a water bottle and saying, all right, here's your equipment. You don't know, no helmet. Now, just take this water bottle and go. Now, they still had swords, don't get me wrong. But this was their equipment. They're carrying, each of them, all 300, are carrying a trumpet, a torch, and a pitcher. And here's what happens. They, they gather around the Midianites, which, by the way, they said were as numerous as locusts. And it says, the three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars. Grasping the torches in their left hands and holding in their right hand the trumpets they were to blow, they shouted, I love this, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Gideon was not ashamed of the name that God gave him. A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. While each man held his position around the camp, the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. And basically, in the next few verses, you see that the people were wiped out. And most of them wiped themselves out. God took care of it. God did not need it. It's funny because people go militarily, okay, here's what happened, and blah, blah, blah. Listen, it's okay to know that God can do a miracle in your weakness. It's okay to understand that God may even use that thing that you're still working on. That thing where you feel like you're not the smartest or the brightest or have your act together all the way. He may use that very thing for you to meet with somebody else and say, you know, I struggle with that too. And that reality may be the very thing that draws someone to Christ. In 1 Corinthians it says this. 1 Corinthians 1, 27. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. He chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so no one can boast before him. In the New Testament, Gideon is referred to as one of the great men of faith. This is the guy that when the angel shows up, he says... What? He says, I'm not even sure I believe in God. He's the, one, he's the one who says, I'm the weakest of the weak. And God says, then I can use you. You ever feel weak? You ever feel like you don't have it all together? Then God can use you. It's those times when we feel like we're a little better than other people, like we're a little superior to other people. Those are the times where God goes, okay, I'll let you do it on your own. How's it going? There's an old story about a pastor pushing a desk across his, his, his uh, office, and his daughter came in and said, Daddy, Daddy, I'm going to help. And she gets in between his arms and pushes him, and then she says, Daddy, get out of the way. You're slowing me down. As he walks off, the desk won't move. She's like, Daddy, come back. And then she helps her push it across the floor. We're that way with God so often. Hey, God, you're getting in my way. I got this. He uses the weak. He uses the broken. Can you admit that you're weak, that you don't have it all together? God wants us to be obedient. He's not so concerned about your ability. It's great if you have abilities. If, if you can talk, uh, uh, maybe you can give a great speech, or maybe you're really good at some talent. That's wonderful, but he wants your obedience. Are you willing to obey him? And do you understand that no matter how weak you are, it's God that gave you your name. It's not about the name that anyone else gives you. It's not about what other people think about you. It's not even about what you think about yourself. It's not about your self-esteem even. It's about the name that he gives you. You are a child of the one true king. He cares about you. He has a purpose for you. Don't let anybody, including yourself, convince you that God is done with you. Don't let anybody convince you that your weakness is too much for God. He wants to use you. 
If you're here today and you've never given your life to him, one of the biggest things and one of the greatest things in Scripture is the story of the prodigal son, which basically reminds us that no matter where you're at, God is always waiting for you to come home. And if you're here today and you want to give your life to him, we don't do a formal invitation, but I'll be here after the service and you can say, Eric, I want to give my life to Christ today. Maybe you need to take that next step of faith in baptism. You can sign up out front and say, I'm going to take that next step of faith. I'm scared, but I'm going to take that next step of faith. You can be an overcomer because he gave you his name for your name. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, thank you that you are the one who says that we're mighty warriors because you have given us your spirit. And Father, it's not because of our own strength, it's not because of our own wisdom that we're, we accomplish anything, but it's by your might and by your spirit, and we thank you for that. Father, I pray that you would help us not to walk in our own flesh, but to walk in your spirit, to walk in your strength, to trust you in life. And Father, also that we would remember that you've called us to a purpose, that every day you want to use us to be a blessing. Every day you want to use us to go out of the way, Father, to help somebody to draw closer to you. So, Father, I pray you'd remind us of that. I pray for that one today who feels weak and broken and like a failure. That today, Father, they would know that in their weakness you're strong. And, Father, especially for that one today who maybe doesn't know you. That today they would recognize their need for you. That they don't have it all together. And today they would surrender their lives to you. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Kind of our time of giving now. Listen, you give what God puts on your heart today. He always takes care of our church when we're faithful. He'll always take care of you when you're faithful to Him. So you do and give like He's called you to give today. Thanks for being here.